Yeah, with the, the Christmas season, it's so much, uh, you know, decoration from the celebration. It's such a, 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 you know, it's an amazing time. And it's, so all those Christmas lights, all that video that you saw there, you know, glory to Jesus, right? It's all to celebrate Jesus' birth, you know, and, and just remembering that. And uh, it's so much fun to see those, those Christmas lights. Um, yeah, I... I I haven't seen anything quite like that live, but uh, there's lots of beautiful decorations at this time of, of, of the year, and uh, really I appreciate it. It's beautiful. Um, so every year this time, I, I, I give this talk just to share about all the foundation that went in to the coming of Jesus, just like when we sang uh, O Come Emmanuel, and the, the, the longing of the chosen people, and how much God invested to try to bring about... Um, uh, the time when uh, Jesus could come. So we're just going to talk about the God's preparation uh, for Jesus Christ, the time that we're celebrating now and remembering uh, Jesus. Uh, a lot of this content is taken from uh, sermons from um, uh, Father Moon. Honestly speaking, without the divine principle, I was pretty frustrated with God. Uh, when I thought about, okay, God's all-powerful, and if God is all-powerful, why did God wait this, you know, according to the Bible, 4,000 years, biblical years, but we know it was actually much longer than that, to finally send the Messiah. I mean, and, you know, someone who's an atheist will even come at you saying, yeah, God's really, he's, he's, a, he's a sadist. He likes to see people suffer, Right? Why did he wait so long to send Jesus? You know, why did he wait so long before even the, the hope of salvation? And I'm so grateful for un the understanding we have through the unification principle and through the divine principle teachings because understanding and appreciating history and first and foremost that God is actually also suffering. That when all the children are suffering, God is not the distant God far away. God is a loving parent who grieves when the children are suffering. And, the, and understanding the fall, just uh, yesterday we were studying the, the, discussing the divine principle in our discussion group. I encourage you, if you haven't spent time studying divine principle or reading it, please come join us sometimes on, on Saturday. But... Um, the reason that God didn't intervene in the fall was first and foremost because God had set up that we would have genuine responsibility. And if God took away that responsibility, then he would be violating God's own rules, own law. And so the principle itself would no longer, you know, the, the basis of existence and reality would no longer work. And secondly, if God intervened in the fall, which created something that God never intended and never desired, in effect, God would be acknowledging that. And, it would, and evil would be able to continue because it would become part of God's creation. But since God did not intervene, then evil cannot exist forever. It just it doesn't have the basis to exist forever. It can only exist temporarily as a twisted version of God's principle. And the third one that, in effect, you know, touches me the most is just, really, if God had taken away our responsibility, we could never become, we could never realize all the potential that God has given us to be divine beings, to, have, to be the true rulers over all the things of the creation, even uh, above the angels. So, by studying the, the unification teaching the, and the principle and then going to the biblical stories, can really appreciate and understand why we're in the situation we're in now, but also the, the power that we have to make a difference in the world and a difference in the, the future. So it's, it's incredibly hopeful, and especially at this time of Christmas, realizing and remembering all the investment that, that we are inheriting from, that we are benefiting from. So, human responsibility is a key component here. That God doesn't do it for us, and he doesn't do it for us so that we can actually be the rulers over this universe. That's the way God designed us to be. So, 
I encourage you in the, in the study of the, the exposition of the principle, the first part we talk about God's ideal, which is you know, to, to create a, becoming a loving individual, a person who knows and experiences God in our life. That's our first great purpose, is just to grow up and become mature and to know God and experience God's love. And then the second purpose in life is to establish a family, to share that love with others, particularly a family, and then multiply into the society, nation, and world. And then finally is our relationship with all the things of the creation, having a dominion, even over the angels, that we're meant to be Lord and rulers and good stewards over all things of creation. So this is the ideal that, that we explore, and, and I encourage you, again, studying divine principle helps us get grounded in this vision of the way life can be and was designed to be. But when we look at that, we also realize that we're not in that situation. So that's why the second chapter in the divine principle focuses on what went wrong and fundamentally recognizing that we lost true love in the Garden of Eden. So we lost that true loving relationship. You know, Adam and Eve, parent and child, husband and wife, brother and sister, conflict. So God's love isn't present there. And that's at the root of every problem that we have is a problem of the lack of the experience of God's perfect, true, and unconditional love. But there's hope. <laughs> the last, the major part of the unification principle talks about how those principles of creation, that ideal, those laws of the universe, are applied to bringing healing, to bringing restoration. And the, the third chapter talks immediately how God worked immediately to bring about Salvation That God, from the very beginning, wanted to save us. To save us. And yet, God would not take away our portion of responsibility. So this, the last section, talks about understanding deeply the meaning of the mission of the Messiah. Why God sent Jesus Christ. Um, all of history, Jewish history, Christian history. A lot of the, the, the biblical prophets and understanding how God has been working to restore and to bring us back to that ideal that God longed for. Uh, let me read a few excerpts. This is from, uh, from uh, Mother Moon's um, uh, message she gave just uh, maybe about uh, four or five years ago. Heaven's providential history has been one of sadness and suffering. In the beginning, God began his creation and created the first human beings to realize his big dream. He also res bestowed responsibility on the first humans. Yet, they went off track. And God's great dream could not be realized. The plan of the omniscient and omnipotent God remains the same at the beginning and at the end. Hence, he cannot abandon his plan, even if it encounters a failure. This is from the Divine Principle, the Exposition of the Divine Principle, the chapter called Eschatology, which talks about the end times. So, God declared through Isaiah, I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. Meaning that despite the fall, God has been working to fulfill his promise to us to restore these blessings, those three great purposes in our life. He sent Jesus to restore us to our original state. Again, this is the purpose that God sends us the Messiah. Returning to uh, Mother Moon's uh, speech. For this reason, as explained in the Bible... Heaven worked for the long period of 6,000 biblical years to enlighten people. How sad and excruciating that course has been. It took 4,000 years to find and establish a people within the fallen world. Why was it so hard? It was because they were not aware of the fact that all mistakes must be indemnified. Everything has to be restored and fixed. So we can't leave anything behind, even in our life. 
know, we make a mistake, we've got to fix it. And if we don't fix it, it gets passed on because it has to be healed. And a lot of the things, challenges that we face in our life are things that we've inherited. But everything, everything has to be healed and restored. And this is God's vision, absolute. Uh, as Dr. Young often says, total salvation. No one and nothing left out. So, just I want to run quickly through the, the, the Bible stories and just remind us that this Christmas season that we're celebrating is so profound in human history. I mean, human history was transformed by Jesus Christ, whose main mission was only for three years. But because of who he was and the quality of his life, human history was transformed. There's no, no continent in the, in the world that hasn't been touched by the work of Jesus Christ. So, to send Jesus, God first worked with Cain and Abel, God's uh, Adam and Eve's sons. And the purpose was, they have to indemnify. They have to, re- indemnity means to restore or to make right again. They had to fix the situation of the wrong relationship between the archangel and Adam and Eve. So Cain was in the position of the archangel, and Abel was in the position of Adam and Eve. So the archangel was jealous of Adam and Eve. Well, so was Cain. Cain became jealous. And the archangel actually caused Adam and Eve to die. And we know from the Bible story that Cain, instead of overcoming those feelings, because God, God was positive about him. He says, hey, look, why are you depressed? Why, why is your face downcast? Don't you know if you do good, you'll be blessed? God wasn't throwing Cain away. But Cain had to overcome the feelings of jealousy and resentment when his brother received the blessing and he did not. And tragically, we know from the story that he didn't. He ended up killing his brother. So God didn't give up. It was a number of years before finally he could call up Noah. And Noah, definitely a righteous man. You know, 120 years building that ark on the top of a mountain. You know, you know I struggled doing a seven-day condition, you know. <laughs> he did a 120-year condition of building something that seemed completely absurd, right? So Noah laid an incredible foundation of faith. However, because his family didn't unite with him, particularly his sons, um, they weren't able to continue the providence. So that actually also was delayed. How painful for God. You know, God is so hopeful. You know, wow, I've got this great faithful son in Noah. If only his children can inherit. A lot of challenge that we face is how we, the people that went before us, you know, I look at, at some of the early church members and some of the sacrifices they made. I look at Christians throughout you know, Christian history. Some of the incredible sacrifices that they made. And I think, you know, how well am I living up to that? How am I even fulfilling and inheriting that? Just like Noah's sons didn't inherit from, from him. They didn't trust and, and, and inherit it. But fortunately, God never gives up, right? So then he calls Abraham. And actually, Abraham, before, he was the son of an idol maker. So he definitely claimed him back from from Satan's side. And through Abraham, even making the sincere and difficult sacrifice of his son, Isaac, and there's a lot to content there. I encourage you, you when we have time to study divine principle, there's lots of deep significance here. But Abraham shows faith. And then through Isaac being also united with his father. Then through Isaac's sons, Jacob and Esau, they could restore the problem of Cain and Abel and the archangel and Adam and Eve. So Jacob, who received God's blessing, was the younger one, just like Abel was younger. And Esau was definitely jealous and resentful and ready to kill his brother. But Jacob goes a a very difficult course, 21 years, finally comes back and he's really humble and he loves his brother. And the huge breakthrough in human history is when uh, when Esau and Jacob united as brothers and embraced. That healed and restored all the way back to Cain and Abel and all the way back to um, the archangel and Adam and Eve. 
So, that's the foundation. That's the beginning point. Now God has a landing place, a family, that he can start to build in order to send Jesus Christ as the Messiah. So let me read this. This is from one of uh, Father Moon's um, sermons called Jesus, Whom God Wanted to Find. To find Jesus, heaven went through all kinds of hardships from the fall until his arrival. That's something to think about. How many hardships did God go through? Especially when we reflect on Jewish history. In order to attend this one man, the chosen people went through a road of unspeakable persecution and the road of death in their historic course. They repeated numerous times the history of struggle where they fell down, stood up, stood up and fell down and stood up again. This is the the pattern of, of history. Fortunately, God never gives up. But how painful and frustrating when we look at at the Jewish history, the the history of the chosen people called to receive the Messiah when he comes and especially prepared to receive the Messiah. So after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they spent 400 years of slavery and suffering in the land of Egypt. You know, 400 years. Then finally at at the end, God is able to send Moses as a righteous man. Moses kind of Moses as the archetype for, for what Jesus would do in the future. And led them out of, of there and towards the promised land. And then it was actually uh, Joshua who led them into the land of Canaan. And there were 400 years where they were more like a, a, a tribal and clan uh, society rather than an actual nation of judges led by judges. So 400 years, and Samuel, um, Samuel was the last judge, and he anointed the first king of Israel. So then we have 120 years in Jewish history of the United Kingdom of Israel. So Saul is the first king, then David, and then Solomon. And when we read the Bible stories about these characters, wow, lots of difficulties. <laughs> Lots of challenges. Saul was jealous of of David, tried to kill David over and over again. But David continued to be faithful and loyal to Saul as the king. And eventually David becomes the king. And then his son, uh, Solomon. The Messiah could have come at this time. The world, it's really prepared. But Solomon also gets off course and he, you know, has many wives and he brings in idols from other religions. And, you know, it's, it's so tragic because the foundation was really there. But God doesn't give up. Now, now the Jewish people have to go through a, a period to restore that mistake. So there's a 400 years, periods, to of the divided kingdom of north and south. And this is the time period where we hear all the, a lot of the major prophets of the Old Testament um, going from the south up to the north. Uh, Isaiah, the book of Isaiah comes from this time. Jeremiah, the book of Lamentations is like the very end of this time period. Because uh, after that, because they still didn't get their act together, they go into an even more difficult course. 210 years we we'll call it the Babylonian captivity and return. So 70 years, they go into captivity. This we read about in the book of Daniel and hear about uh, Ezekiel. And then 140 years for them to come back and, and set up the temple and, and get the foundation back together again. Uh, these are the prophets uh, um, Haggai, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Malachi, which is the last book for the Christian Old Testament. But even that, after this, there's still a 400-year period where God is, prepares the entire world. It's God doesn't, the Messiah doesn't just come for the chosen people. It comes to the chosen people as a foundation for the world. So God's preparing the whole world. You know, 400 years, Buddha, Confucius, Lao Tzu, Zoroaster, uh, even the, the Greek philosophers. And the Roman Empire, at the time of Jesus, had united all of the uh, Mediterranean Sea under one rule. So the world was really prepped and prepared to receive Jesus. So, amazing thing. If you look at all this time period, biblically there's 2,000 years from Adam and Eve to Abraham. 
400 years they spent in slavery in Egypt. Another 400 years they spent uh, as a tribal society in, under the judges, led by judges. Then 120 years of a united kingdom. 400 years of the divided kingdom. Another 210 years the Babylonian captivity returned. And then another 400 years of preparing the world to receive Jesus. This is the foundation for Jesus. You know, when we look at, you know, this is not insignificant. The fact that Jesus is born and comes is, is just a tremendous accomplishment in God's providence. And it took all this effort. So the coming of Jesus, the birth of the Messiah 2,000 years ago, this is just, you know, shakes the universe. <laughs> And it's on the foundation of just incredible suffering, incredible sacrifice. That's something that we should always be grateful and appreciative to for. And even when we reflect on, on, on our own life and think about the, the significance of the past 2,000 years, the sacrifices made by Christianity to lead us to the time that we're living in now. So, in this time appreciating and being grateful. So we're going to have lots of celebrations. It's going to be, you know, it's fun. It's Christmas time, right? Let's celebrate and really enjoy the season. And at the same time, let's also deeply reflect with incredible gratitude the significance and meaning of this time and all the investment, all the price was paid for Jesus to finally come. Uh, let me close with this uh, again from Father Moon. One of his sermons called, Let us celebrate Christmas on behalf of heaven. By virtue of Jesus' birth, the providential will that God had been working to fulfill for 4,000 years since Adam had come to pass. Due to one man, Jesus, the worries of God, the worries of humanity throughout the course of history, and the worries of the time of that time could all be gotten rid of. We stand in awe of him. So much investment went into the coming of Jesus Christ. And Jesus came with such potential to transform the world, to heal the world. Wow, what a thing to celebrate, right? So this Christmas time, let's make sure we remember and deeply uh, uh, value the richness of what we inherit uh, through the sacrifices that were made so that Jesus could be born. And even, again, thinking about the next 2,000 years, this is why I encourage you to study the divine principle. You know, look at all how God worked these past 2,000 years in Christian history so we could be live at this time. The time when Jesus and the Holy Spirit could call Father and Mother Moon to their mission as true parents. So please join me in prayer. Father and Mother God, our loving Heavenly Parent, we thank you so much for your work and investment throughout history that you've never given us up on us. And even in our daily lives, Heavenly Parent, we want to come before you this, this Christmas season grateful for the incredible foundation that we inherit and the sacrifice of all those who went before us and open up our hearts, Heavenly Parent. The parent, as we come before you and reflect, just want to pause for a second and, and let you in, Heavenly Parent. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your investment in each one of our lives. Thank you for Jesus Christ who came 2,000 years ago and gave his best, his everything to try to bring healing to this world and the, and the foundation that he established that Christianity could, could spread throughout the world bringing the, the understanding of you as our loving God, our loving Heavenly Parent and that we should, that love is the core of everything Heavenly Parent thank you for the healing power of your love and as we go about our day and, and take on the, the mundane activities and of, of, of life and deal with the challenges and struggles that always we can remember the precious gift the precious inheritance that we have because of all those who went before us so we thank you Heavenly Parent 
uh, welcome you to celebrate this Christmas season together with us and offer this prayer together as your sons and daughters. Amen and adieu.